into it. Lock, cock, and ready to rock. <laughs> Welcome to this episode of Small Bike Stuff. This is the oh, podcast. You're alive. <laughs> That's good enough. I'm keeping this, man. They will know that it's a good subject. Uh, I'm Callum. I'm here in New Zealand, and we also have our good friend Dana. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He's in Bangkok, Thailand. So um, this episode is about me uh in some ways shapes or forms but it's also about uh the world of riding a small motorcycle long distance and 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 i guess quintessentially what i want to get across to people and what i always try to get across to people when this Mm. subject comes up is that it's achievable for anyone that has ridden a motorcycle or scooter that even if you're confident riding a bicycle you could do Mm. three to four months of upskilling on a bike and you could Mm. achieve a trip like this so um yeah i'm keen to talk about it yeah, I'm, I'm as well, and I, I know a lot about this trip, but I, I would also say it's not an episode about you. I think it's an episode about something that helps shape you, yes. right? And if we yes. look at it from that perspective, because I, I want to frame the trip first, because you rode KL, a city mm. I'm, I love, I'm fond of, I worked there mm. for a long time, to Bangkok. Yeah. Two great cities different countries and you bridge the gap but what two gave capitals you this, yeah two capitals what gave you this idea uh i had always loved the idea of riding small bikes long distance ever since i mean how many times in my life am i going to say ed march but we'll just say ed march again mm. so ed march is um the guy from the uk who had shipped his honda c90 um and we're going a more modern square headlight honda c90 to kuala lumpur and he rode it all the way to uh the uk and he did it in a kind of a, a roundabout way he had to ship his bike a couple of times just because of uh, blockades that were happening at the time when he rode you couldn't go across myanmar very easy yeah so it just was what it was and and then on top of that i was a big fan of top gear the uk television show growing up and they did a big vietnam tour where it's one of their typical um, adventures. You get handed a box of money and they're like, cool, we've got millions and millions and millions of dong. And they all walk around these car dealerships trying to buy cars. And they're like, yeah, that's a thousand dollars. So um, you're, you're not able to buy a car that it dawns on them. They've got to buy bikes and they ride bikes the whole length of, or most of the length of Vietnam. And, and that was kind of my idea. Like I, in 2014, I went over, no, 2013, I left New Zealand and did a little bit of travel through Vietnam before I tried to settle in Thailand. And, at that point, they were offering Easy Rider Vietnam um, mm. Top Gear tours. And, and it was just Vietnamese dudes with 150, 250cc cruisers. And you'd sit on the back as a pillion because, like, I didn't know if I was confident enough to ride by myself at the time. Never did it. Never did it at all. Um, went and lived in Thailand. Mm. Um, many, many, many years passed. Relocated to New Zealand. Many more years passed. And I had a, a good friend group here in New Zealand that were both into small bikes. And basically, I said to them, let's go ride small bikes in Southeast Asia. Um, mm. And I've got an idea on where we could start because I'd watched Ed March's episodes so much. Mm. Um, I had stuff to do in Bangkok eventually, so I needed mm. to go there. And um, it was just literally the most logical route. Like we wanted to do Vietnam, but it's so done to death. You just basically rent a bike from one of multiple companies. Mm. Um, and you, it's kind of like for me that, that it sounds odd because Vietnam is, you know, gives you a real war experience but i view riding that vietnamese length uh, or that vietnamese trip um, to be super sanitized mm. um so malaysia a place i hadn't really explored before having to go across a border really appealed to me and then jumping into thailand a land where i can fumble my way through with very childish level thai language skills also appealed to me and having mm. my two best friends with me also appealed to yeah, me of course um, another thing that we'll get into later is that Malaysia has really good entrance rules for Kiwi passports. Okay. Um, and, and they also have really good vehicle buying laws compared to Thailand. Uh, so so yeah. let's, let's talk about that difference, like buying a bike in, in Malaysia versus Thailand. So Thailand, uh, when I first lived there in 2013, kind of, you would be led to believe if you searched online that unless you had a long term form of visa to let you stay in the country officially, Um, you won't be able to get a motorcycle in your name because Mm. you had to go to your embassy and get your address verified. Mm -hmm. Um, And the only way they would generally verify your address is if you had a proper visa. However, I learned the New Zealand embassy, um, and I was on a tourist visa at the time, entering, trying to secure some form of employment. Um, I learned at that time that they would would, uh, 
if you, you basically I, I went to the reception of the condo i was staying in and said hey can you guys just write a letter saying that i live here and they were like why and i was like please 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 they eventually did signed it i took it to the new zealand embassy they verified it and then i paid a dealership to get the bike into my name mm. and that whole process was days of paperwork um yeah. malaysia is not like that at all and you've bought bikes in thailand haven't you i've never bought a bike in thailand <laughs> oh oh yes. they've been under someone else's name jib jib buys me bikes okay thanks, jib. <laughs> yeah if jib gets like real bored and wants to buy anyone else a bike just let me know that I'd be king. <laughs> so yeah no uh because of the the embassy trip so every time you go to the u.s embassy it's a day basically okay. and you got to pay to get anything signed so mm. why am i paying a thousand baht to get a signature when i'm married to a thai who can buy the bike and i can ride it yeah um it's 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 one of those places that i forced myself to go through the process because it was like the only option available mm -hmm. to me um so it was one of those things and i did it twice and it was painful and there's still actually a bike in one small province in thailand riding around that's in my name and has like a registration sticker from about nine years ago <laughs> and um that's still riding it around like it's i'm pretty sure it's still in my name but malaysia um are really great so um a lot of countries you can just turn up and on entry they just give you three months um mm. of of entry you don't have to apply for anything beforehand you just turn up and boom you, you don't even get stamped anymore you used to get stamped but after covid they've stopped stamping you so mm. you just turn up they scan your passport boom welcome to malaysia for three months nice um and they get less people abusing the visa rules or the, the like the the tourist visa uh, rules there so they're kind of not so fussed about you leaving and coming back mm. but don't don't guarantee that from my words like if mm. you get pulled up and they kick you out i'm sorry but like hey I, <laughs> what are you doing it's you've been here a year mm. um but we turned up and i'd researched that you could just get bikes into your name because there was a mm. blog online of some western couple that bought a honda wave in in kuala lumpur and they rode all around southeast asia nice. so i just turned up we found a shop we bought the bikes and it wasn't even a question of, Hey, can you do the paperwork? They just did it. Hmm. Um, and we had to meet them later in the day and get taken to a random government building where they signed over our details and you get, you get forced to buy mandatory insurance at the time and all that kind of stuff. So, so what does mandatory insurance cost in, in Malaysia? It was dollars, like mere dollars. It was like the same as here five in Thailand. Bucks. Yeah. Like they call and it, it pa Powerball. Right? Yeah. And it's like a hundred baht. For I don't a year? think, yeah, I don't think it would have covered me for anything, but you have to have it. And the thing they were real wary about over there is your registration label and stuff. They said, keep it in your wallet or keep it on you or keep it hidden under your seat. Mm. Don't have it exposed on your bike and viewable because it's super common in Malaysia for people just to steal your registration tags. Oh. And then they go down in Malaysia, you can go to any motorcycle shop or any car dealership and make up any number plate you want. Here too. Yeah, yeah. So you just turn up and say, hey, can you make me up uh, the number plate for this? registration tag and then someone's got your um yep. a, a year's worth of writing for free so mm -hmm. yeah it was just um a, a, literally a decision of convenience that's the mm -hmm. reason we we went to malaysia um yeah it's um turned out to be a little bit inconvenient at the end when we needed to get rid of the bikes but that's okay we'll get to that I, I thought you were just de disassemble uh, unassembling them and putting them in your uh <laughs> in your luggage and shipping them home we kind of yeah did that it wasn't <laughs> It was an expensive way to, to go about it, but yeah, it's like to I said, smuggle well, bikes into New yeah, Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. We ended up ditching a lot of the parts and just bringing home like the engine and wheels. So, um, it was an expensive lesson, I guess. This is so let's talk, talk, let's talk about your route because this is, it's a, it's a fun route and it goes through some interesting areas. So you yes. start in KL yeah, so and then you went to Penang. Yeah, we did. We rode straight there in one day. So I'm looking on Google Maps and I always forget when I'm looking on Google Maps that countries have these things called hills and mountains. <laughs> and um, I just look at a straight line and I'm like, cool, that's doable. I look at the estimate that Google tells you it's going to take. And that's for obviously a car going 100 kilometers an hour on the highway. Yeah. And um, so we went to Penang, which is about 350 to 400 kilometers in a day. And oh, real, uh, real quick, let's talk about what the bikes were. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So really quick, um, I ended up, uh, we went through like three or four shops. They all had horrible choices. And we went to this one shop, a real small hole in the wall shop that had these really nice looking older bikes. And we're like, oh yeah, these guys, there was one outside being restored at the time. 
and it's like okay they're putting effort into it they're replacing some parts it must be worthwhile i got a honda wave 100 1998 nice. honda wave 100 a friend of mine got a 2004 honda wave 100 and another guy got a 2008 yamaha legenda 110 which is known as the spark in okay. thailand and um they were just little tiny bikes 20 years old that could handle it and in kl just for example we said to them hey put new tires on and then we went to another shop and got them replaced with alloy rims with another set of new tires Mm -hmm. um we replaced visually cool things we put baskets on them um those interior baskets right yeah yeah the knee baskets i like to call them but in hindsight we probably should have looked a bit deeper on the bikes because there were a few issues later on but um, <laughs> yeah we grabbed them woke up one morning and um off we went we took a photo in front of the petronas tw- towers and mm-hmm. uh we rode and we rode and we rode and we rode and then a friend of mine thomas um started getting some excessive vibrations from the front of his bike mm. um and it turns out his front wheel bearing was collapsing about 50 kilometers into the trip nice and um, there's just this alloy sludge around his front <laughs> wheel and um we pulled into a local motorcycle shop, got that replaced, and you know they replaced it with the exact same method that damaged the bearing in the first time, just as hard as they can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it held out; that was fine. Um, and we rode to another town and filled up with gas, and then it was just taking ages. And we looked at the maps, and we're like, "We're not going to be there till nine PM tonight." Mm. And then we suddenly, my friend grabbed my phone, and he's like, "You've got no highways selected, no <laughs> tolls selected. Why?" And so we'd been That's riding the fun them. of small bikes. <laughs> it was, but we had planned to gun this road on the highway. And every t- yeah. every now and then you'd ride over top of it and see it. And I'd yeah. be like, ah, oh, yeah, no, nah, it's fine. We'll get on it soon, like eventually. And yeah, long story short, um, it took us eight hours to get to Penang. Um, <laughs> three hours to cover, I don't know, 100 kilometers. And then nice. the rest of the day just absolutely slammed out. So Malaysian highways are way better than New Zealand. Have you tri- driven on them before? Yeah um they're way better than thailand too as well like yeah yeah so did you did you spend the night in penang yeah so we arrived in penang and stayed in georgetown we designed our stay there so that we could use both of the long bridges that connect one of them's like 24 kilometers long one of them's like 15 kilometers long and we wanted to go over both so we rode over on one stayed in georgetown but when we arrived our friend's bike kept breaking down so um and it was like 5 p.m. And we had this New Zealand mindset about it all, like, oh, 5 p.m., everywhere's going to be closing. It's like New Zealand. <laughs> In Asia, um, that's like uh, things are opening. Yeah, you're just kind of getting ready. So we um, quickly looked on Google, tried to find a bike shop. It was like the nearest one that came up on Google was like 15 kilometers away. And our receptionist, as we were about the receptionist of the hotel as we were leaving, like going out, it was like a guest house. Mm. he's like what are you guys doing we're like we go to this shop because we need to fix our bike he's like you guys are idiots like said that to us <laughs> you guys are idiots there's a bike shop about five minutes down the road so we got his bike fixed and i think uh-huh. that in itself was mind-blowing getting a random shop to like rebuild uh to re-tap and drill the threads on a carburetor and a man- mm. inlet manifold on a bike at 6 p.m yeah on a, on a like a friday night with what it cost any- you 15 dollars yeah like it was, it was just so cheap and um i think that was kind of like a, a trial by fire we were so tired and exhausted at the end of that day we were sitting there at dinner that night um having conversations about the things that happened that morning referring to them as the previous day <laughs> so like remember yesterday how your wheel bearing collapsed and then later we realized it was it was that morning it was like 12 so was, hours ago it was a really long day it was a really long day but penang was amazing i highly recommend checking out um anywhere in malaysia outside of kl yeah KL's i've been beautiful. to penang a few times and uh absolutely fantastic place to go to not not just georgetown either i love georgetown but batu ferengi is phenomenal yeah yeah it's um it's it's hard to quantify i don't want to get into this whole like giant penang conversation but um it's been occupied by many different people for a long time it was a main trading route for thousands of years and so it's um it's got some it's got some really unique parts about it it's a really cool place but leaving there we went straight across the border into thailand so we only spent one and a half days riding in malaysia Um, so so you got to penang and then mm. you just gunned it straight up to the border yeah so uh we had a friend to meet an internet friend in in hut yai in thailand okay. so we literally just rode over the um i think it was so, Buk- 
Bukit Hayam border or something like that. One of the main border crossings. Yeah. So how far for how long from Georgetown to the border? I'm assuming you crossed in uh, into Yala. No, we didn't Songkla. cross into Yala. We went to same to into Songkla. Yeah, into yeah. Songkla. So that it's it's more to the left side of the country. Yeah. Um. So we didn't go straight into which is known as Bitong and all that kind of stuff, which is quite mm. popular because it's a really windy road that a lot of motorcyclists yeah. take in Thailand. We went onto a boring highway um and route we four. left it you, you jumped right you, on route four almost yeah yeah we we got on it pretty quickly so we went across the border um it took us about three hours to get there we'd left at six in the morning got to the border about nine stopped at a restaurant close by mm. and they do all your documentation for you and give oh. you like your mandatory insurance for thailand and everything okay um the so you do that does. Yeah, like there's like five restaurants lined up that say insurance, oh. border. Yeah, so you just hand over your ownership documents, which is another reason we bought bikes. Because if you rented a bike, you have to get a permission from the owner, and that has to be certified mm. and all that kind of stuff to, to actually take it across the border. If it's in your name, and you have there's to no bring problem. it back. Yes, yes, you do have to bring <laughs> it back. Um, granted, we only got like a thirty day. You know, the bikes were only allowed into the country for the same amount of time as us. Our bikes got mm. their own physical entry like stamp in the passport oh okay that's cool um so that scared me when we left because we we didn't um we didn't take them <laughs> back again but um yeah we went we went across the border and um it was a really interesting thing because we had been given all this documentation by by the malaysian side and you go into the border and you have to park your bike and walk in and they just mm. think you're someone from a bus that's had to walk through yeah so my friend walked through and walked out and then i handed over my bike documents and um they were like wait did he have bike documents too and they're like oh no and they like oh. ran off and grabbed him like the immigration police <laughs> dragging him back he was shitting himself <laughs> for lack of a better word um but we just hadn't stamped our bikes into the country so we could have we literally could have illegally taken our bikes into the country because once we stamped those bits of paper we just jumped on our bikes and rode through there was no check oh, okay um so you could hypothetically enter yourself but not your bike into the country if you're real smart about it or could you hypothetically enter yourself and your bike with no check? <laughs> I, it was under construction at the time. It was 20, 2019. <laughs> and I recently went through the same border check again yeah, uh, just last year. And um, it would, yeah, there's a bit more security this time. Okay. Actually, it actually had some because it didn't the first time. Uh, All right. But yeah. So yeah. not possible. No, no. I mean, we could try. But I'm not responsible for your jail term. <laughs> so you're in Sun, <laughs> so you're in Sun Claw now. Yeah. Now, um, w this is so you're only two days into the trip, and it's a seven day trip. Yeah, yeah, seven days. That's it. Um, we're cracking 350 to 400 kilometers a day at the moment. Not bad. Um, not bad. Too much. Too much. And in hindsight, this whole trip could easily have been ten days with yeah. a whole bunch more stops. Um, from from KL to Penang, it didn't matter, and then going to Saint Clair, it didn't matter so much. Um, but from this point onwards. We constantly missed cool things that we would have liked to see in hindsight. You'd see a sign for a waterfall. You'd mm. see a sign for um, a national park. And, and we, we missed all of those because we had deadlines to make. But in Song Kla, we were really lucky to meet up with a local guy who um, we hung out with him. It was our first experience of the um, like the, the hectic security down there. We went to the, one of the, like, the central malls. Yeah. And they were... Uh, like putting a mirror underneath our bike and scanning our bike and um, making us open our top box and expecting everything because they they have the occasional um, bit of strife occurring, I yes. guess, down in the south. So a little bit. We we were like, heck, this is wild, and uh, we eventually dropped all our stuff off at this guy's house, and he took us in a proton pickup, uh, nice. proton people people mover, to to a Thai bike show that night. Nice. So we went to some tiny little, um, it was like Patalung or something. Um, province and went to this little basketball court in the middle of like a school in the middle of a coconut plantation at like 9 p.m at night on a saturday for a bike to look rally at the, yeah for, to look at the locals like we are four or five people with each bike it's wild they roll them into this um like concrete area yeah. and then polish all the wheels and like clean the rubber tread and everything so yeah. that perfectly on display so we got to see a thai bike show that night and um spent the night back at his house after being um uh what's the best word we were kind of victimized with alcohol by the local men they would just <laughs> yeah, keep handing us bottles of stuff questionable uh, got, brew yeah we got we got whisked on stage because we're the only foreigners at there and 
I spoke three and a half words of Thai, so they <laughs> saw fit to throw us on stage and I introduced ourselves like, hello, my name is Callum. My friend and me, we like Thailand. I have bike. I have bike Honda. He has bike Yamaha. He has bike Honda. This is my literal translations. And um, we get down and we're just being handed, yeah. Um, and now you're a local celebrity. You can yeah, go back yeah. to that province and they, like <laughs> you don't pay for a drink. <laughs> it was um I, i'm a bit more portly now than i was no one recognized me but um yeah it was a wild experience to be truly amongst the locals and yeah. um the next day we woke up and we rode to krabi um, oh, which is an inter- yeah, that's... interesting ride itself um, so l- let's talk about that that pace yes right because you know like you said it's too much yeah it is Right to much. me though, I like to ride hard. Like I like to hit a, a like I don't always right, but like there are mm. times where I like to get out and I I, I can push four to five hundred a day. Yes, and I, you know just all out on your own, you know, going. I think it's different for people who live in Thailand full time, and yeah. for my friends who this was their first ever time coming into the country. Mm-hmm. And so they knew from the start that a lot of the stuff they see, this will be the first and the last time in their life, they might see that exact specific area. Mm-hmm. Um, so we could have, in hindsight, spent a lot more time um, uh, checking things out. A, a smarter way to do it would have been to do 150 to 200 kilometers per day, smack that out early in the morning, arrive in the new place at check-in time, and then you've got from 2 p.m. till 10 p.m. to check out the new area. And that could be yeah. on your bike, going and yeah. riding up the nearest mountain, or it could be jumping on a long tail boat and going and checking out an island or, yeah. or something like that. I think that's a much more wise pace for people who – because I, I'm not fussed about riding 500 kilometers, 400 kilometers in a day. We did it and it was fine. Um, but for the, I felt a bit bad for my friends at the end. I was like, cool, you've just done a, a highway tour of Thailand <laughs> with about six hours in a town each end. Um, so sorry You do about miss that. some things. Like when, like I agree that you miss some things for sure when you do it that way. But, you know, and it is nice to be able to stop. But I do think like the approach, like you said, like if you can crank hours in the morning, and get like if you can get on like 5 a.m like an hour before the sun comes up get on the road you know get your tires warmed up and just be cranking and then two o'clock in the afternoon you can essentially call it a day yes and say like all right like we've we've clocked 350 400 kilometers uh, it's really hot right now. It'd be a great time to you know have some Krapau and a Leo and lay down in the hotel for like an hour. You know, and I think that that's four, 45 Leos, yeah. not one. Yeah, but you know, a, a Leo or <laughs> two. But you know, it, it's I, I with ice, of course, with ice. Yes, <laughs> rude not to, rude not to. Uh, and you know, I, I think that's a good way to do it. Cause I, the other thing, I don't know how your friends dealt with the heat here not well yeah because it's that can be rough especially if you're wearing we we in new zealand um because we're all in the same small bike gang which is really just like a jokey group of not serious stuff but we have these denim vests that um, are covered in patches and we like to wear them when we're riding our small bikes everywhere and we took them with us to, to to ride in southeast asia and we we had them on for the first day while we were walking around trying to buy bikes and then we folded them up nicely, put them in our front baskets, and they didn't come out again until the end. Because one thin layer of denim over top of what we were wearing on the top half, which um, we had motorcycle pants on, we had nice covered shoes, um, but on the top half, it was just so hot. And I had a backpack the whole time that I ended up going and buying long sleeve cotton shirts. Mm. So if I came off, I would have been really mincemeat, but I didn't. And, and, and you know, you have to live a little sometimes. It's definitely not advisable, but it was a great heat um, dissipation method because you got buttonholes and yeah. they just kind of get air blown and it was like permanent air conditioning. It was like sitting in front of a hairdryer for about eight hours. Yeah, blow- with one blowing up each sleeve. And yeah. yeah, when I so when I go out and ride, um, I, I usually do wear a jacket or I have like a, a vet, like a, a motorcycle vest, but they're all mesh, right? So there's decent yeah. air yeah. circulation. Uh, denim really doesn't have a ton. I don't actually have motorcycle pants. I haven't been able to find any that fit my calves. It's uh, okay. actually like my, like I can fi- get, get them to fit my waist and fit my thighs, mm. but none of them fit over my calves. 
Mm-hmm. And like that's that's problematic, obviously. So uh, I just I made a pair of jeans and I, I probably should sew some knee pads into it. But yeah. 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 I mean, there's there's so many different ways you can think about how uh, to ride overseas. And But when you come from New Zealand and even when you bring summer rated gear for New Zealand, mm-hmm. that's still too warm yeah. um, to ride in a lot of the time. And I guess realistically, you know, we were on a hundred two, two of the bikes were 100 CC. The other was 110 CC. Mm. My, my, my limit of speed when it came to mechanical sympathy for the bike, um, we had our phones on GPS. It ended up being 76, mm. um, 77. It would start to vibrate too much. So 76. 76 is a sweet it, spot. That was it. So you've got to consider like riding at 76 kilometers for eight hours mm. is, it's um, it starts to feel like twenty or thirty kilometers per hour after about two hours of riding. You That's feel like right. you could just get off the bike and walk beside it because you're just kind of being punished with your speed. I think one of the other things to to really keep in mind when when you talk about like the speed and the gear is if you don't have sufficient airflow, it, it does feel. It, it, you don't also realize how much you're sweating, but you are like perspiring quite a bit, like even while you're riding because you're just getting baked by the sun. Yeah, yeah. I know. Usually, I'll wear like a an Under Armour, like a long sleeve Under Armour shirt under my jacket, and that is it. Mm, because, mm. like, I just want as few layers as possible. I want to, I want to promote as much wicking of uh, moisture as possible. Yeah, I completely agree. One of my, one of the guys, Thomas, he just um, rode in a t shirt the whole way in jeans, <laughs> jeans, t shirt, and shoes, and he was happy. And uh, you know, like a. He would he would wear incredible amounts of sun cream throughout the day. Yeah. Um. And you know we were getting yeah it's dusty it's dirty and like he'd wash his arms off at the end of the day and it would just be like this black acrid crud and that's one thing you got to consider as well is that um yeah. when you when it's a bit drier and it's a warmer season um there is you know it's not like the north where the, the farms are all burning the whole time mm. but um yeah there's it, the environment's definitely different to what I was used to riding and we'll just put it that way yeah and I one thing like I've like I've my friend Adam and I took a trip down to Shumbury a few years ago uh, yeah. when we were working on this, uh, this little project to send uh Packer power into outer space. Yeah. And uh, he rented a, a Forza, oddly enough, one of the bikes we talked about in a previous episode mm. and uh, the, the Patia cruiser. And uh, we rode down to Shumbury and he wore shorts. And oh, so uh, <laughs> by the end of, by the end of the trip, uh, he had like a, a sunburn on the top of his knees for, you no know, thanks. like, you know, for, for a few, few centimeters. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's just, it's one of those spots that's just painful too. It really is. It's, um, it's better to be covered. And once you're moving, it is what it is. Um, one, one, one thing I would change, which I didn't have on that trip would be a modular flip face helmet. Mm. Um, that, that makes such a big difference. Just, you know, at every, every traffic light, even 30 seconds of, um, air. you know, yeah. air, it was just helpful. Um, and yeah, so that was kind of what I experienced is that we exposed ourselves to the hottest parts of the day because of the amount of time we were riding and the distance we had to ride. Um, and because all our routes, uh, the route was predetermined because of where we had to be and, 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 you know, everyone had jobs to get back to in New Zealand as well. So yeah, we did Songkla, went to Krabi and it was the biggest contrast and, and my friends remarked at it dramatically that because it was the first place that was just full of Western tourists. Kuala Krabi, Lumpur, yeah. yeah, Kuala Lumpur has a lot of tourists. Penang has a lot of tourists, but um, you'll actually find Malaysia doesn't have a lot of like American, Australian, mm. Kiwi, British tourists like um, Chinese, like Thailand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, we, we got to Krabi and it was just full of tourists. And my friends are like, can you take us back to Song Kla, to that bike show? <laughs> that was like a way better vibe than this. So they, I, um, Krabi's known yeah. for that though. I mean, it's an, a known destination for, for that type of thing. I, um, I enjoyed it because it was, uh, uh, we only had to spend a night there and we were just outside of kind of, uh, from Aonung beach. And so we could just ride our bikes around and just kind of gallivant and explore. And it was nice just to kind of expose them to that, I mm-hmm. guess as well. Um, not expose it as if it was a bad thing, but just like, Hey, this is equally Thailand as much as what we just experienced was Thailand. Mm. Um, and I really, I think my aim for that is because people, especially people that haven't been before, they have a lot of these preconceived notions about what Thailand is. Um, it's either a tourist destination or it's a red light district or it's mm. a, um, and, and, and you, I showed them 
seven you know each night was different every single night was a completely different thailand yeah um and then that's what i really liked about it and and despite the fact we didn't enjoy krabi as much as um you know those tourists that have booked out a week in their resorts we still had a good time yeah and to your point too it's like you could live seven days in bangkok and have a different bangkok for seven days i mean thailand Agreed. does have i it, to me it's the greatest country in the world i say this all the time mm. i love it and there's it really is a, a place with unlimited uniqueness and that, that's yeah. beautiful about it. Yeah. It's, so, um, it's a wonderful place. Yeah. I am, um, as you know, I'm a big fan. So, I mean, if fan. we want to, if, if you guys keen, we could make a bonus, uh, <laughs> podcast episode at the end of the season or just us riffing off how much we like Thailand. Yeah. Let us know. <laughs> it would be really boring to watch. I, I think that'll probably be part of every episode. <laughs> it is. It is. It um, is. So from Krabi, did you continue up four? Did you cut across to, uh, like Suratani and Nakansi Tamarat? So no, we went, um, we did, we were basically, it was odd because we're sitting there, um, at looking out from the beach and I said, Hey guys, that's where we're going to be tomorrow. We went mm. to Phuket. Oh, um, so you, so just drove the, you drove the bridge. We did a big, we did a horseshoe basically. Yeah. You went up and then straight back down again. Yeah. And because it was such a short ride, it was only a couple of hundred kilometers. We decided to leave a bit later. We left right at like 10, oh, uh, 10 or 11 AM. Yeah. 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 Regretted it massively. Yeah. And we rode up four, along four, down four, and then onto the uh, bridge and stayed in stayed in Patong. I wanted to show them. I wanted to show them like uh, if you thought if you thought um Krabi was super touristy, like no, yeah. this is. I wanted to show them there was a completely different um aspect of it, and it was cool just to go down and explore Phuket a little yeah. bit. Like I'd been there before, um, but we got an oil change, got our first oil change there. Nice. Um, and uh, yeah, the next morning, and we did um, essentially nothing. I was actually feeling a bit average, so those guys went out and um, drank longer than I did, and I, I went back they, to the they room. They indulged slept. in the offerings of Patong, did they? <laughs> yeah, they, they, they did. There's not much to offer <laughs> apart from seediness and just I don't know. There was exactly. a lot of Russian tourists exactly. back then, and yeah, yeah, it's um, it's it's pretty. It's a it's an acquired taste. It is. So the next yeah. day, though, you you wake up, right, yeah. and you leave Phuket. Now, do you shoot? Do you continue up four up to? Yeah, Renan? we 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 went up four to Chumpon, um, or all the way until it crosses over to Chumpon. Yeah, so we oh. went to the end of route. Uh, well, to where it joins onto Chumpon, basically. Okay. So we left. Um, we left Phuket. Went right up through Phang Na or Phang Na. Um, went through two national parks. So we went through, what is it, Sipang Na National Park? Yep. And um, then we went through Ranong. There's another national park there. Mm -hmm. And this was the day of regret is what I like to call it. Not because it was bad. It was an amazing you place. a lot of stuff. So much cool yeah. stuff. You could have spent three or four days riding through there. Yeah. Um, stopping in one little nice, cute homestay in the middle of nowhere and just gallivanting into the mountains. Yeah. There was like endless signs, waterfall, 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 waterfall. And by like the fifth one, we were like, fuck, what have we done? <laughs> the other thing yeah. with that is that you're, you know, you're going along this section of the Gulf or not the Gulf, the coast of uh, the Andaman that is, yes. is not as popular. So you're seeing things that are, are very unique. It's, it was amazing because, you know, um, throughout the whole trip, um, every city we went to, the public transport was a different form of vehicle. Yeah. Um, in, in Hat Yai, there was a lot of um, older song towels and a lot of motorcycle taxis. You went to Krabi, um, there's a lot of those sa selling sidecar things. Yeah. Um, you go to Phuket, um, it's little like Daihatsu pickups. Yeah, the hijet, the hijet. Yeah, the hijets. That they call tuk -tuks. Yeah, and then and then not only did the vehicles change and, and stuff like that, the faces of the people change. Yeah. When you get up closer to Myanmar, um, you know, um, people just looked a bit different, yeah. and it was like, wow, we're really bordering on another country. And I, we didn't really stop properly and look, but at one point, you're about a kilometer from from Myanmar. Yeah. Just and, look at looking at the water, and it was amazing. Yeah. And and actually, like uh, you talk about the faces changing when you come into Sangla Yala. Like people still look a lot more Malay. Yes, right? they do. And then yeah. you you move your way up a little bit, and you start to get more of like that Southern Thai look. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit by the time you get to Krabi, you're probably you know like more of what people probably envision as Thai people. 
Yeah, right. there's a big mix. When you go into those tourist areas, you know, you ask every Thai person, where are you from? They're from somewhere in the northeast or yeah. way up north. Or you know, It's it's a, it's one of those cities that people generally aren't born and raised there. Yeah. And then yeah. same in Phuket. Yeah. And then you get yeah. a little, you start to, by the time you get up to like Champon, uh, mm. Prachap Kheri Khan, you're kind of central mm. Thailand now. You are. You, know. you really are. Going right beside that border um and you go beside uh the the big inlet there or the big river that kind of exposes itself yep. between, uh, beside me and my that was that was fascinating just riding up through these little mountains right. and um we were really starting to be pushed for time here um well, and it was a it was a relief by the time we got to the point where we're out full veers away from the border and heads over towards the ocean again hmm. that's kind of was your oh it's 5 p.m yay we're slowly getting towards the end of the moving day. towards the gulf right yeah, like yeah. So one thing I, I an area like with that river right and um anywhere that you've got a location where there's a, a this big geographic item like a, a river something that's going to shape the communities around it i always yeah. find those areas so interesting because everything is built around the infrastructure that was developed for this natural resource and I, I find agree. that absolutely fascinating from a from a perspective of like, hey, this is, you know, th this is a whole community or a whole way of life built around this. And that river also happens to be a natural border between Thailand and Myanmar. Yeah. And there was certain points where uh, it was quite clear there was cross-border trade happening. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think there was, you know, boats going across the river and Burmese people would come across and sell their stuff in the market or yep. pick stuff up and take it, take it back again. And um you just noticed it, you know, and these are small fleeting glimpses as you're riding past. You mm -hmm. see a song tail full of kids and yeah, it was just, um, again, pushing really hard for through that section. Maybe like, I agree. Like, like those days, like you could definitely miss a lot. Yeah, we did. We did from all the way from, if you look on a map, we went all the way from the, you know, like South of Phuket, all the way to Chumpon in one run. And it's just a long, it was a long day in Chumpon really, um, we didn't explore enough. We we stopped there, and it's it was a, there was a few Western people, but not many. But they were all on ferry, or waiting to go on ferry boats out to uh, Kotel, Kotel, yeah. um, I believe. So yeah, you'd see a few, but we just stayed in some random guest house in the middle of a, a coconut plantation and and just <laughs> drank some beers and chilled Still out. Still really. sounds pretty epic. It was. It really was. Now um, from Chumpon, it was a long you're, day. You're only really a day's ride from Bangkok. We could have gone straight to Bangkok. Yeah. We could have gone straight to Bangkok. If, but we didn't. if you continue to hammer it. Yeah, absolutely. But um, we wanted to stop in Samut Song Crime. Um, I spent some time there when I used to live in Thailand, and they've got a couple of cool tourist features. Mm -hmm. And I realized when we were doing this part, I was like, every place we went to probably, you know, if I had lived there for three or four months, I would have known these cool little things that you could have gone and yeah. seen, like the biggest temple or the coolest thing. But I knew them there. So there was the, the, um, the folding umbrella, um, railway market where there's a train going right through the middle yep. of everything. And then there's the, a couple of floating markets there. So we spent one night there, jumped on a long tail boat. Um, but we, we left so early from, from Chumpon. It was before dawn, um, that we arrived there about 1 PM, 2 PM. We stopped at a nice motorcycle shop called PPN motor, mm -hmm. which is in Ratchaburi, Pak mm -hmm. Um, real, real, really great shop for modern, modern small bike parts. Um, now for and we anyone stopped. who doesn't know, I just want to clear it. Like Samutsakan is, it's literally the the town or the province on the edge of Bangkok. Yeah, we're, so we were in Samutsongkran, which is the next one down. But oh, Samutsongkran, um, so, okay. Yeah, so Not but Sakon and they're right beside each other. Okay, they're um they're a fifteen minute drive from each other. Yeah, yeah. So they're they're really close, and and Samutsongkran is the smallest province in the country. Is it? Um. And it has the most amount of temples in the country, oh. supposedly. So it's a tiny province, just full of temples. Um, the, 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 the province's um, thing is the uh, f mackerel fish. They have like a mackerel fish festival, and oh. it's pretty feral. I don't really like it. It's pretty feral. Um, yeah. So they have this festival where you've got like mackerel burgers and mackerel fries and mackerel this mackerel, and mackerel yeah. that. And uh, it's a really interesting little, you know, once you get into these smaller areas and you become, you know, kind of acquainted with the community, you really can experience quite a lot of um, odd stuff. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that it's a, it is a cool, that part of the Gulf where it's like, where, so this is at the top of Thailand and it's just sort yeah. of like turning down the Eastern seaboard or sorry, the Western seaboard. 
Mm. And I find that area again geographically just to be interesting. You've got this uh the Mekong come the Meklong comes out there, right? That's it, yeah. So we're beside we're going stayed beside the Meklong River and that's where we jumped on a long tail boat that yeah. night. And there's so many little backwater canals and you learn that um a lot of them, like thousands of kilometers of canals were hand dug yeah. by dudes back in the eighteen hundreds under Rama five, one of the older kings. And um Back in the day, a lot of them have been kind of filled in these days, but hypothetically, you could get from like Simutson Kram almost up to Bangkok through random little tributaries and canals. That'd be, um, that'd be a dope adventure. It really would. You'd get lost if you tried to do it these days. But um, there's a, yeah. there's a, so the next province over, there's a great little community called Ta Shalom. Uh, okay. Which, yes, I know of it. You know, yeah, yeah I've, I've yeah. been there a few times. I absolutely am fascinated by it. Um, mm. and it, it's very unique and it's a future bike trip for me, for sure. Like, yeah. a, a, but I've taken the train there, but it really, I think is a bike destination. It could be pretty wild. There's a lot of people that go to Samut Song Kram to go to a place called Don Hoi Lot. And yeah. Don Hoi Lot is, yeah. Um, it's a really cool place to, to ride a bike. You can ride, like if you ride in a day, you go there, you eat on one of the, um, restaurants that are over the water in the Gulf of Thailand. Um, and then come back in and you can see the train market, the last train crossing that evening, then nice. jump off to the floating market. It's a real nice, like one night trip that you can do on bikes. That's, um, seeing a lot of, a lot of cool stuff, but we stayed there. And then from there, we could have done a, a 55 hour minute, um, hour long ride into, into Bangkok. Yeah. But we didn't, but we didn't. What'd you do? Tell me. <laughs> we, uh, we, we, we got through our first proper police checkpoint of the trip. Um, so there was a small police checkpoint on the road up to Ratchaburi. Okay. Um, so we'd already been in Ratchaburi when we're entering in Samutsong Kram because that's how small it is. Yeah. And then we go into Samutsong Kram and then you ride out of it into Ratchaburi again. And we went up to a place in Kanchanaburi called LHM Motorcycle Museum. Okay. And this was a place I'd seen on, on, on Facebook. And um, I was sold it as a place. Oh, like they've kept one of every single model I've ever sold. And they've been around since the 60s. And you turn up and it's just this big open shed of bikes stacked about five high, about 15 long. And so there's about, yeah, there's, you know, there's probably including the wall and the ground display, there's like 100, 150 bikes on display, but it's all in Thai. So we we, we um, got a little bit of a, a tour by the guy that spoke the most amount of English that worked there. <laughs> but for us, it was, um, it was incredible. And I, 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 to learn as much as we could just by looking at things, they had, um, random models that you only got in Thailand, little two stroke Yamahas and oh. stuff that only came out for like one or two years. And, Interesting. um, it, it's, it's actually on the side of a Honda dealership. So, um, we went there just to look at this and then we stopped at another place called Popman's on shop, which I made a video about as well. And Popman's on shop is a Honda classic cub, mm. um, part shop. And then, um, slowly we gallivanted into Bangkok, which the ride from, after the museum and the bike shop, the ride from the bike shop into Bangkok was its own unique individual adventure. Cause if you're on a small bike and you're riding into Bangkok, it's, um, there's a lot of rules you've got to face. Yeah. The bridge. The... So what's the bridge situation? Cause there's, I, there's only a few you can cross, right? Well, we didn't have to go. Well, we did have to go on a bridge, but we didn't know how to do it. Like we were sitting at this bike shop, like and put in, bangkok on in a location on maps and it just kept going through these roads i knew we couldn't ride down hmm. so i had to click no highways no tolls all of that kind of stuff and we went on this convoluted route it sent us off like three times the wrong way we had to double back um, but eventually we ended up coming over the like tuxin bridge okay Sapan Tux, Sapan Tux in. so i don't don't know how we managed to get from the uh west of bangkok onto the Sapan Tuxin bridge somehow and into the city. We did like kind of a big loop around almost. Um, but yeah, it was intimidating. And, and I knew in Thailand, you're not meant to ride in the middle of the road. You meant to stay on the left as the rules. But then we had police officers and other people passing us in these like big 10, 15 kilometer long traffic jams coming into the city. So we just started lane splitting our way into the city. Now I know the only other way I can think of if you don't take the bridge is from Samut Sakan. I, actually, I don't even know if that's, I think it's somewhat, somewhat Prakan, but it's like the yeah. little section of Samut Prakan that is on the other side of the river. I actually so can, think, 
you can take from yeah. where the army base, the old navy base is, uh, yeah, Pui, Pui Sua Samu, you can take a ferry with your bike back over yeah. to the uh, Paknam, uh, Talad Paknam. Interesting. And, okay. Um, because I've I've made a whole I did a whole video about like that that area and then the navy battle there, but yes, yeah. Um, I think like for sure, like you can take your bikes. So, like if you didn't want to take a a bridge, because I I again I don't know which bridges. Not every bridge is legal for bikes. No, they're not. They're not. They're really not. And it was just, um, I mean, like. Every time I've gone in and out of Bangkok on a bike, I've gone a, like a different way, or yeah. I've gone over the same bridge, but I've been so confused because I'm just following maps. I'm like, kind of like almost not looking at the road hmm. when I'm <laughs> when I'm doing that. But we got into the city, which is really nice, and we eventually um, uh, I meandered our way through to some accommodation that was kind of near a sok and um, and, and jumped off the bikes near the uh, near the uh, hacienda, the ranch there yeah 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 it wasn't too far away and uh <laughs> people who know know <laughs> yeah just um there's not no one wearing the, the hats though you know you thought there would have been because it says Cowboy. anyway yeah. um it was really confusing but you yeah. know there was a lot to see there's a lot sure. of riding going on that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah there's some really happy people walking around um we 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 put our bikes away, man, and we parked in this condo um, that I booked through Airbnb that specifically would allow us to to to, to have our bikes there. And we mm. parked them up, and we did not ride those bikes again. Um, <laughs> one of the guys one of the guys had to leave in about three or four days, um, mm. and we forced him to do what we wanted to do with the bikes. And um, and then we just kind of used public transport, man. The That's, BTS, the SkyTrain. It was just so easy. Once you're in Bangkok, especially if you're if you want to go places that you know you're not gonna be able to park the bike easily, mm. it's just so much better. And and why deal with all the heat and all that radiant heat that's stored in the concrete while riding around Bangkok? If you're if you're just trying to get out and have a good day, Bangkok mm. has, in my opinion, like some of the best public transportation in the world, better than anything in really America. Does. And so, sure. you know, jump on a win, get in the train, take a bus, you'll be happy. Completely agree. So we, um, we, we just went out and saw what Bangkok has to offer. You know, I went and got a succulent down on Nut from a Jiang Ning and then, um, uh, we went, I took this. Yeah, absolutely. No, that one was okay. Oh, okay. They actually used new needles, believe it or not. Um, this is when I was a bit wiser. <laughs> um, not like my first trip out to Wat Bang Kra. We won't talk about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, I, I took my friends on the quintessential typical Bangkok tour. We went around the Grand Palace. Nice. I took them on a long tail boat. Nice. We went through the north, um, north of the city and all the canals. And, and let me guess, they never yeah. complained about dual pricing. No, not, not once. once. <laughs> not once. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, I just have no time for that. So, no, it was really incredible to um, to get to Bangkok, but we were left with one big dilemma, and that's what do we do with our bikes. Our bikes mm. only had about... 15 days left or 20 20 days left in the country mm. um and we didn't want to take them back we hypothetically had a couple of options we could have ridden them all the way back to uh just over the border with malaysia and sold them at the first bike shop we came to they would have bought them for a couple of hundred bucks but it wasn't worth doing that for us we could have put them on a van or a bus or a truck and got that that was going over the border and got them to drop them at a bike shop but mm. once they're out of your hands there's no guaranteeing that actually gonna they're going to end up where they need to be mm -hmm. um, unless you're there to oversee it. So um, we meet the two, two of us that bought Hondas. Mm -hmm. We bought them because the engine had the same bolt mounting pattern as a classic Honda we had here in New Zealand. Okay. So I took the motor out. I just drained the oil, got all the fuel out of the carburetor and um, put that in a box and took it down to Thai post and sent it home. Um, <laughs> what, did they, they were like, what did that cost? <laughs> Uh, too much because I was sending them through EMS, the, the most expensive option, without yeah. realizing that the um, there's a middle range option called Sea Air Land, yeah. and it's exactly this. It takes the exact same route to New Zealand as the as the fast one, yeah. and costs half the price. So, I um I schooled myself. We paid, I think, a thousand dollars for the bikes. And by the time I stripped all of the parts off the bike and paid for all the shipping to send the wheels home and the swing arm home and to send all that kind of stuff home probably paid another five six hundred dollars oh, um so um yeah and then we had to pay another thousand baht to get a random bike shop to come pick up all the bits of scrap we didn't want which was cheap that's only forty dollars yeah 
but um yeah we we got to a point where we had all this big piles of bike scrap down in the car park and um the condo residents were starting to complain just... to the uh, management and so the airbnb lady messaged us and said you need to get those bikes out or i'm gonna have to kick you guys out so That's... we um <laughs> we we disassembled the bikes and took the parts home we wanted and in hindsight i would not do that again no um i would i would make i would only i wouldn't ride a bike into thailand again from malaysia in my own name unless i planned to ride back into malaysia with it well i we met a we met a gentleman in ekamai who he had been buying bikes and, and bringing carrying on the the luggage with them with the engines yeah he was relocating um two thai members of his family back to uh australia and they yeah. all had business class seats on the plane so they had 60 kgs of luggage each <laughs> yeah and he split he split a honda grom um a brand <laughs> new honda grom yeah between them and he got it home and it's assembled and um he's in a country i won't say where yeah and um he <laughs> rides that round with it's just damn it damn it <laughs> so this australian um <laughs> sent this sent these parts home and uh he rides he rides a honda grom that he he assembled out of some luggage on um, his and, and property works. only yes absolutely yeah it's not on the road off-road. at all you will never do that never do that not with so, yeah. any of his like 200 small bikes absolutely not no. he definitely won't swap swap number plates over and ride it around definitely he never... definitely never said he would do that no absolutely he's a responsible young responsible man. gentleman yes yes <laughs> so um it's 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 fun doing a trip like that and it, and it kind of you know it was over so quickly um and and while you're riding some of those days seemed really long you know i'm i remember you know by the seventh hour of a 10 hour day mm. you're really you're you really kind of well, you know, some uh, that long day we did on on Route Four from from Phuket up to Chumpon. I remember yawning at eleven a.m. Yeah. on the bike, and I was like, "This is not good." You know, it's eleven a.m. and I'm starting to feel a little bit tired. So, how was your ass t- after like uh, all that riding? Uh it was very raw. Yeah, very very raw. And um, I've tried a that bunch. Was from, of- that was from the bike riding, yeah. by the way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I. I, I, I <laughs> <laughs> we know what hat yeah is uh known for so when you stop by there we know um and you put three three kiwi boys together mate yeah it's a horrible situation <laughs> um one thing like i've tried numerous solutions on the seat and like nothing really seems to like like you get you get relief for a day i think the my my thing these days is if you get the foam to be how you want it um and then go to mr diy and buy one of the um aerated seat covers that have like a kind of a little waffle that's what i have one of those yeah yeah and that's the only way to get at least a little bit of air Mm. um flowing otherwise otherwise you're pretty cooked but um no it was great i I have no regrets about that trip we're gonna go back and do it again next year but like i said um i guess this comes into the would would i would i change things or would i do them differently yes Mm. um ideally i'd like to have a trip where everyone could experience bangkok because i'm such a big fan of it but when you're taking random people um, and you've only got a certain amount of time. Most people only have two weeks that they can spare uh, for a holiday from door to door. You know, mm. they want to be leaving New Zealand and arriving there 14 days later. So, and you and you've we're going to bring those bikes back to Malaysia. To Malaysia, yeah, to sell them again. So this next trip, we'll start in Kuala Lumpur. Um, we'll do a completely different route over overland in Malaysia. Not go to Penang straight away. Um, we'll just go through some of these mountainous kind of tea plantation areas. Mm. And go over the border at Yala into a place called Bitong and do um, the route there. And I think there's like there's a big glass skywalk thing in Yala now as well. Yeah. Um, so we'll go and see all that and go through southern Thailand and um, and end up kind of about the most furthest north part we'll go to is about Surat Thani and then we'll come back down again. Yeah, it's it's so, still, still south. It's still southern. It's um it's southern Thailand hundred percent and you know I'd love to take people to Bangkok but that long 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 stretch and the um the amount of time we'd have left at the end just means that you're you at one end of the trip you're just having like two or three or four days of straight four five hundred kilometer riding and yeah for people coming along and joining me it's not the most attractive for prospect. me I love that that ride though from Suratani you you're on forty one as I recall and you're you're shooting up yeah. four um yeah. that that's just such a great ride for, it's rewarding for me. and i i like just that like you could do that you could do suratani at bangkok or even like to Ratchaburi in a mm. day and it's yeah. still a it's a long straight beautiful 
fun drive, in my opinion. Yeah, you just have a diet of Seven Eleven. Yeah, at the um, at every PTT yeah, every station. PTT. <laughs> Amazon you're, coffee, Seven Eleven, Five Star Chicken. Yeah, so, and look, if you're lucky, there might be a KFC. <laughs> um. <laughs> but you know, like for real though, I think like that's just it, it is a it's rough kilometer wise. It's rough, like you said, diet wise, like. But if you're just on four the whole way, I mean, it is, it's like one of the few highways in that particular strip that you can just drive and it's like, oh. mm. yeah, it's a beautiful place. Yeah. Um, there was, there's, there was no regrets after that trip, just some stuff that, um, you know, we'd learned and, and, and we'll change next time. Uh, one of the guys that came last time will be joining me next time and we'll probably have a, a small group of people just coming to adventures. So nice. Um, that'll be like late February, early March or, or early February. I'm not sure at the moment. I'll probably book tickets in the next week or so. Nice. And, um, and we'll touch base. But, uh, yeah, I think, I think what I'd like to stress about this whole riding bikes overseas thing is that it's entirely possible. Um, please do it mm. legally. If you're going to like please. have the correct license yeah. class, have insurance that will cover you because, uh, there were multiple close calls on that trip, which I haven't mentioned now because they were just fleeting moments, yeah. but you know, you have a trip, a truck try overtake another truck and you're on the inside and then you realize there's another truck there. And if you're not careful, you're getting squashed. And, mm. um, if, if you're surviving, you're in a hospital where they won't operate on you until your bills paid mm. beforehand of what it will be. And, you know, there's cases of people going over there, getting their jaw shattered in a motorcycle crash and they're sitting in a hospital not being operated on for three or four weeks because the GoFundMe hasn't made enough money. Yeah. So um, make sure you are licensed and legal if you do it. But um, yeah, get over there and do it is the main and thing. Carry it's the best place to start. Carry, carry insurance. 100%. Yeah. 100%. It's, um, it's, if you're unsure about, like if you want to do a round the world trip, but you've never really experienced the chaos of riding a bike mm. long distance, mess around in Southeast Asia and it will set you up for anywhere. Yeah, I think like if in it's like we talked about the uniqueness that every day you can be experiencing something unique, right? That it does kind of prepare you for almost anything you're going to see like around the world, right? You have in the south, the north of Thailand, you've got great mountains to ride on, twisty roads, complex like yeah. switchback chicanes. And mm. then you've got Bangkok, Hat Yai, these cities that are just grueling to to sort of navigate through like these big urban areas and mm. everything in between and long stretches of like rice paddies out in Isan and flat mm. and just go. So you could really in this one country sort of get all the skills you need as a rider and like really cut your teeth and then be ready to do uh, as far as like a, a long distance small bike road trip. You could be yeah. ready to do anything. Exactly. And I mean, you can do these trips anywhere. That's the other thing is if there's small bikes available, like you can do it anywhere. And, you know, the thing I always think about is, you know, you live in Thailand. People dry, uh, fly over there specifically to ride bikes. Is there on your doorstep. I live in New Zealand. People travel here just to specifically tour the country on yeah. motorcycles. It's on my doorstep. You can do anything, and it's just kind of getting yourself into a perspective where you see the adventure and what you're about to do. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. And I mean, make yeah. ride your own ride. Like I've said, I've said this yeah. before. Like, like don't feel like you, you're you have to commit to doing it the way someone did it or to to doing whatever. But ride your own ride. But be be the best rider you can be too, because like a lot of motorcycle people talk about like motorcycle skills and like, like all mm. the fundamentals and you can really practice those so easily on a small bike uh, to get you ready for something like this. Yeah. Completely agree. Yeah. It's um, it was a fantastic time. So yeah, if you want to come with me next time, uh, it's probably too late cause I'm pretty sure I've got uh, like filled spots on this trip, but, um, definitely check me out on, on social media, on small bike stuff on Facebook or Instagram mm -hmm. and, and follow along. Cause I do post about this kind of stuff regularly and I definitely won't be the last trip I do the next one. Um, so yeah, stay in touch for sure. And I, I think like how epic to like have a guide that has been through it, you know, and yeah, the border yeah. and I can fumble and, my way through all the dodgy situations you 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 need to encounter or you want to encounter. Randomly I can, giving talks on stages and bike shows. Yeah, and... yeah, <laughs> embarrassing myself. That's what I'm good at. That's what I'm good at. But um, thanks so much for asking me all these questions about um about that trip. It was a really thanks really wonderful time in my it. life. Um, my friends that know that I did that trip know how much I've milked content out of that trip because. <laughs> 
it was just something I'm so proud well, of. Well, now you're um, milking your last trip. So, I mean, like, yeah, we, yeah, well, we yeah. met a year ago, and now you're still putting videos out about that trip? Absolutely, man. <laughs> I could edit more. I could edit more. I'll re-edit your interview to do, like, a fourth interview with you. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's it, man. Look, I've, we'll, we'll end it here, but thank you so much for watching. Uh, as far as our podcast goes, if you've been enjoying it, um, share it with your friends. If you If you like what we've been doing, then – show other people yeah. um we have a few more episodes coming up this season um specifically uh focusing on small bikes in singapore um because i <laughs> uploaded a video about small bikes in singapore and i ins- started probably singapore's biggest motorcycle related internet argument in the last year um, that, that was so- insane it was uh, like if you haven't seen that video go check it out it was at like the, yeah. read the comments because the comments are bonkers I developed much thicker skin after reading those comments because I was getting, if you've never experienced Malaysian or Singapore um, frankness or upfront kind of personalities yeah. where they've got no no qualms in telling you how they really feel, yeah, it taught me a lot. Um, we'll be jumping into um, size-wise when a bike is not a small bike. Yeah. And um, we're also going to do a, a feature coming up soon on the god of small bikes, uh, but we won't talk about what model that is just yet. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so I was... Yes, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for watching. And, uh, well, yeah, thanks, Dana. Thank you. We'll see you next time.